Adam Piacente from Marin SAT Prep come back to the Bell Tip Library to do his great presentation on college admissions. Hi, everybody. How are you? Good to see you this morning. Um, my name is Adam Piacente. A little bit about me first um, before we get started. I'm a retired attorney. I was a, um, actually a law professor for many, many years. Um, I was an expert in, in the 90s in online legal research. Had a couple of textbooks published. Actually wrote the official guide for the service at Lexis.com, um, which some of you may have know. Um, but uh, in around 2005, I decided I had enough of teaching law students and decided I wanted to try something different. And so I got into teaching SAT prep. And I really do like teaching high school students better than law students. Um, uh, since 2000, started my company in 2006, Marine SAT Prep, um, we, uh, we have helped literally thousands of students. I started just going around the hills in Marin and eventually had a classroom in my own house. And, and as that um, started, I started getting much more business. We started having tutors working for me and um, eventually had a classroom in Montecito Plaza in San Rafael. Uh, so now I do private tutoring online for the SAT um, and I've been doing that ever since. Don't have any tutors working for me right now, especially after the break, and I think I've just sort of enjoyed downsizing at this point. So it's just me now, um, but for many years I had, it was a, it was a much larger operation um, than it is right now. In addition to that, I'm also very proud of be, to have participated in doing a lot of community service um, with this stuff. Um, San Rafael High School, I've taught classes at. Tara Linda, I do a lot of um, college nights for. Um, I'm also on the um, College Enrollment Action Team for Marin Promise, which is a sort of a catch-all for trying to get uh, underrepresented um, students into, uh, into college. Um, San Rafael Public Library, we did a program for many, many years doing free practice tests. Um, of course, Bell Tibler and Library, I think Rebecca, we've started in I think 2012. Yeah. I think it was 2012. I was looking over. So, so that's it's been 10 years. So yeah, we've been doing this program here, and then uh, Huckleberry Youth Programs works with um, students in the Canal District in San Rafael, um, and I did courses for them for many years as well. So that's that's sort of me, um, and so let's talk about the test. Okay. So how important are these tests now? Here's the thing, in this first section, um, you know, there is a lot of sort of misinformation about this and sort of the major media beat writers on this stuff are, have really, I, in my opinion, done a real disservice um, in terms of explaining exactly what's going on with how important the tests are. There's sort of been a, a movement to sort of try to convince people that the tests aren't as, aren't as important as they are. But we're going to see how that is, in my, in my view, very misleading um, about what's actually going on. And I'm here to dispel some, debunk some of the sort of urban legends that are, that are cropping up about this. Um, first of all, admission tests are required or optional at over, and we're going to talk about the difference between required and optional as well. But, Admission tests are required and optional at over 95% of four-year not-for-profit colleges. And it's probably actually more than that. There's actually, the, we're going to talk about test blind in a little bit, which is that they don't actually want to see your tests at all. But there's only about 80 schools in the country that are. Now, yes, the UCs and CSUs make up about half of those schools. But the vast majority of the 2,000-plus other schools here um, Either want to see, either want to see your scores or require them, or will make a test optional. And, when, and as we're going to see, test optional really is not what you think it is in terms of optional. They really do want to see these scores. Um, according to the National Association of College Admissions Counselors, in 2020, 83 percent of college say the test scores are of moderate or considerable importance. So it, they really do want to see them. Let me show you the, the chart here. So these are factors of importance of college admissions. And really, when you think about college admissions, the, the, the old sort of um, analogy is the uh, three legs of the stool. Um, the first one is your grades. The second leg is your test scores. And the third are your extracurriculars, recommendations, um, essay, and things of that nature. 
Um, as you can see here, 90% of schools consider grades to be of moderate considerable importance. 83% admission test scores. And then all of these other ones sort of are the third leg right there. But um, that's really what you're looking for in terms of, um, you know, in terms of importance, this is what the colleges themselves are. This is a survey of all the colleges that did this. So they do want to see these scores. Okay, and, they, and, and it is really important if you're interested in a four-year, in a real four-year college, that, that, you, that you take the test because they are going to want to see them. Okay, the other thing about um, the, these tests is that they're often, uh, often used for um, academic scholarships. So generally, as a general rule, most schools, if you're in the top 25% of your incoming class, for SAT scores, that's sort of the cutoff for non-need financial aid or academic scholarships. And you can get some significant money back if, you're, if your SAT scores are good enough. We had a student, um, a couple of students I've had, that were um, actually seniors. I got a call from, uh, from a mom. She had a second semester senior. When I don't usually get second semester seniors coming in asking me for SAT help, um, they, uh, she, uh, she was into school but they told her that she had a 25 on her ACT, and they told her if she can get a 29, then she can get a $12,000 a year scholarship. Which, so we trained her up, she went from a 25 to a 29, she got the number, and it ended up being about $50,000 in scholarship money. Um, so it was a really good investment for her to do that. And, it, and, and, and that is, um, you know, it really is important to think about not just, oh, I want to get the best score I can so I can get into the best college I can. Sometimes you might want to get into a college that maybe not have as high SAT or ACT scores, but you might be able to, to um, get some scholarship money back on top of it. So it is, can be a very good investment to make sure that your numbers are as optimized as good as they can be. Okay, so, but let's talk now about the, the new test that's coming. So this year, starting in March of 2024, so coming up in the spring, um, the SAT has gone to what they call a digital SAT. And it's a new test and um, it's a bit shorter. Um, it's a digital format, so students take it online on a computer in the testing center. And there's a, there's a whole interface that they use through that. It's adaptive too, and this is the thing that students um, have questions about a lot of times. And the, the adaptiveness is that what they do is they give you two modules of each, uh, verbal and math. First module they give you is to determine what they're gonna give you for the second module. So the first module is a, a general, easy to hard, test, depending on how well you do, they're going to give you the second module. If you do well on the first test, they'll give you the harder module on the second one. If you do not as well, they'll give you the easier module. And basically, the way it works is if you do well in that first module, you're guaranteed of at least a 600 score, or that's how people are interpreting this now. And so they give you the harder module, see how far you go up the ladder on that. If you don't do well, if you get the easier module, then the most you can get is about a 600, and they're just determining where, how far up to 600 you can get. Does that make sense? So that's how they're doing the adaptive thing. So you see students who come out of, like the PS, they just had the PSATs, which is the preliminary test um, that they give to juniors just to give them an idea of what's going on. You had some students say, wow, that second test was really hard, that second one. Well, yeah, it means you did well on the first one. That means mm -hmm. your scores are, whereas some students are coming, oh, it was really easy. The second one was much easier and so on, so. And that's for all sections? Um, they, they are verbal and, and verbal and math are the two basic mm -hmm. sections, and that's for both of them, yeah. Um, <clears throat> the biggest problem, the, uh, the biggest change on the, on the digital SAT is really they've made a lot of pretty substantial changes to the verbal side of this. Um, it, there's shorter passages. They used to have these long, page-long passages, double-column passages, and it was really a lot of reading. Now it's much, there's shorter snippets with questions after each one to interpret, and it's a real difference, and it's a different way of, of sort of approaching the test at this point. 
Um, new question types, there's a lot of different types of things they do. For instance, they'll give you uh, like a notes passage and have you summarize the notes, things, things like that. Um, there's no essay anymore. There used to be an essay on this test at the end. The essay really wasn't that well adopted. It started in 2015 um, with the last time they changed it and the ACT, ACT as well adopted the, that as well. What they were really looking to do was just get a raw writing sample from the students in case they thought you didn't write your college essay. But in terms of whether how they, they weren't really using it to evaluate your writing skills, they just wanted sort of a raw writing sample. It just became more trouble than it was worth. And so the, the digital SAT has now gotten rid of it entirely. And the ACT, while they make it optional, um, is really, it's, it's not really, nobody really does it much anymore because the schools really don't care anymore. Um, and I look to see the ACT finally just giving up on that as well. Oh, and the finally, yeah, uh, return of vocabulary words. There, for many years, um, SAT has always had tested vocabulary words. 2015, they got rid of that. Now they're bringing it back. So vocabulary does become important again for students, um, which in my opinion is a good thing. Okay, so let's talk about the difference between the ACT and the SAT. Okay, and in general, the, um, the way it works is in terms of the scoring, each, for the ACT, each subject is out of 36. We'll talk about the percentiles in a minute, but each scoring is, is 36 points a piece. You, they average that to get what they call your composite score. So your best composite score and your best score on each of the subjects is 36 points. Okay, and then on the digital SAT, each subject is from 200 to 800 points and they add those together. So the best score you can get is 1600 points for that. Um, and as you can see, the way they work, these are the, the, the English, math, reading, science for the ACT in order. And you get the verbal twice, or the, the two verbal modules first and then the math module second on the SAT. And the way I like to talk about um, the difference between the ACT and the, and the SAT is that the ACT is much more of a sprint. The questions tend to, tend to be much more straightforward, but the, there's a lot of questions in a, in, a, in a shorter period of time. So what you're really, what you're, what's really going on is that you re, the student really has to move quickly. So if your student tends to be more methodical, likes to take their time, the ACT may not be the right test for you, but if they're the type of student who really just likes to move quickly through the test, you can get it down, the ACT is often a good test for those students. Um, it's also a good test for students who need extra time because it really tends to, uh, because that extra time really does tend to help. Because like I said, the questions are, are not as tricky. Like I talk about the SAT is more of an obstacle course. There's more, especially on the math side, there's more, um, IQ based learning, which is really sort of the where the SAT kind of came from. Um, and so they still they still use a lot of those sort of IQ test uh, functions in there. Um, so it tends to be a little tricky. Once you know the tricks, though, it tends to be OK. You, they tend to do all right with it. But there is it is a bit of more of an obstacle course, whereas the ACT is much more of a sprint. Um, sometimes um, I like to say that it's a lot easier to, to show students how to get over those obstacles than it is to get them to run more quickly. If they really are just slow and methodical, you really don't want to have to just push them to do it because their accuracy goes down and so on and so forth. But if they are, if they do tend to just move quickly through tests and you get a lot of students who do this, they just like the straightforwardness of it and they just move quickly, then, then there really is a difference in the types of students that like each test. Um, the practice tests for these are the plan, sophomore, PSAT for sophomores and juniors, just basically an introductory test for them. Um, juniors, for junior year, um, the PSAT offers um, uh, national merit scholarship qualifiers um, so that you can, uh, so and you can get a little money back for it. It's also something nice to put on your, on your um, application tends to be uh, top 2% of your state. Now, since California is the most populous state, um, then it's a little more difficult. 
on the last PSAT last year, I think it was something around 1440 to get in the top 2%. Deciding, getting back to your question from before, before deciding how to decide between the SAT and ACT, uh, really good idea. I love to have my students take both tests first. Now, not everybody does this, but you have my students take both tests and then we compare scores to see which one they actually are doing better at. And a lot of times it's a feel for the student as well, like it's just too, ACT is just too quick or SAT is just a little too complicated. I didn't understand how they were, how were they writing the questions. Um, but these are specific concordance tables that, 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 that are accepted by everybody basically. This is, these are the official concordance tables which show you sort of what a score equates to on the other test. So for instance, if you get a 30 on your ACT score there, it, that's the equivalent of a 1370 on your SAT. Make sense? Okay. So use the concordant tables, find out what's going on. I will tell you that usually students, two student, a student takes both tests, they're gonna come out usually about a point better, ACT point better on the ACT than the SAT to start. Like usually when you see that, if a student will take a test, that usually tells me they're actually, aptitude is pretty much the same because the, the test, um, once I get a student in, a lot of the, that point difference is really just the formatting of the test is a little more tricky. Once they understand sort of how the format works and sort of what they're looking at, um, that point differential goes away. So if, they're, if you're a little better on the ACT just to start, I wouldn't necessarily take that to the bank, but that's the one I want to take. But if there are specific, if there's a real difference in the numbers, then you really want to go with it. But it's also having the students take it to get familiar with the test, but also what feel, how you feel about that test. You know, how you, what more test you feel more comfortable using um, is really, is, 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 is a big important factor because if you just feel like you're struggling with it, it's really not gonna be fun to do. But if you feel like, yeah, I feel comfortable doing this, I can do this, then you're really gonna learn more when, you, when you're doing the prep for it. Okay, so let's talk about when to start prepping. So earliest, summer before junior year, I get a lot of, I get a lot, I get mothers calling me, my students are freshmen, um, uh, you know, I wanna start now, and I'm, look, I'm happy to do that, but chances are we're still gonna be doing lessons junior year because, because they're gonna wanna, they're gonna, their developmental cycles, especially now with COVID and everything, where students have missed a bunch of time, um, you really, you, you should wait on this stuff till junior year, till summer going, summer going into junior year is the earliest. And that's actually a, a nice time to start um, because you've got, um, you know, you don't have a lot of other things going on and it also kind of keeps you mentally fresh so you don't get, get that summer brain going. Um, and it's a really actually a good time to start in the summer for that, especially if you've got a student who you think is, um, you know, possibly could get national merit. Um, or if you're just struggling or if you get busy, just need, need some extra space and time to focus, that is, a, summer's a really good time. The best time of the year, really, um, for most students is right now, um, early junior year. Um, and we're gonna talk about sort of how you wanna, you know, sort of the calendar for this, but starting now when you're back in the swing of things, you kinda get your, sort of, get your feet underneath you in terms of junior year and you're sort of, okay, so now I'm ready to, to look at these tests, best time to start is really right now because the way the calendar sets up, you don't want to be doing this stuff late junior year. Junior year is the toughest year for high school students, bar none, and especially second semester. And by, you know, April or May, you know, I get students coming in, you know, they're just, you know, what, where am I at, what are we doing? Oh, uh, you know, they're just walking zombies at that point. So, so you really want to try and see if you can front load this earlier on in the year so that you don't end up having to, having to study for this stuff late when you've got AP exams coming and finals and everything else. You'd rather get that out of the way, get, get your prep out of the way early. Now if you want to take the test because you've taken it before, that's great, you want to retake it in summer. But I will tell you those May and June tests are some of the worst performing tests of the year. So you really want to see if you can get the bulk of your studying and, and scores testing done before the end of the semester there, before the end of the second semester. Um, and the latest, I, you know, I do have a lot of students who, <clears throat> every year I get students who, um, uh, you know, come in as seniors. I haven't taken this test yet. I need to take it. I realize I have to take it. Um, what can you do? That's not necessarily a bad thing. 
I have a lot of seniors who do really, really well. Seniors tend to do better than juniors anyway, just the way it is. Um, you don't necessarily want to wait on it if you if you don't have to, but if you do, it's not necessarily critical. It's not you haven't necessarily you know locked yourself out because seniors can do really well. They're focused. They're more mature. They're more business-like about the test, and they really want and they're really motivated to do it. So so senior is not is is actually not a bad time to start if the, if if the student really is motivated to do it. Okay, so here's the calendar. Now, I recommend, highly, strongly recommend that every student take this test at least twice. Take a real official test at least twice. We'll talk about it in terms of your scores in, in, in a little bit. But it really is important you take it twice. Basically, um, what you tend to see is this. <clears throat> Students prep for the first test, take it, and they come out, if it's a good program, they'll come out saying, you know, I did pretty well but I still think I can do better. And it's the second time you take it that, so they'll, they'll improve, but it's the second time they take it that not, you see, really see the numbers pop. And the reason for that is it's like anything else. You know, you, you jump in the pool the first time and you swim, you don't swim as well as you do the second time. And all of the different factors and all of the different sort of, you know, anxiety that you feel and everything, the first time you're in that is much more than the second time. And so, if you can, so you really want to take it at least twice. And so what I recommend is you take it twice in junior year, and then you have a portfolio of numbers that you can use in the summer to go to schools and say, okay, well, you know, I got my number here and here. Can I get into this school? Can I get in this school? And a lot of times, you know, you go visit a school and they'll say, well, yeah, um, uh, if you can get your math score up by about 50 points, I think you got a good shot in getting in. So all of a sudden, senior year, you're like, okay, let me take it again, see if I can get my math number up. And that sort of is, so, so you take it two times in junior year, and then come back if you need to the third time senior year. And I will tell you that senior, the senior year, those, those mid-September for the ACT and early October are by far the best performing test of the year for, uh, if, when you're a senior. Um, they, the students are focused, they're back in the swing of things. Um, that August test, they, like the mid-July, August, especially that late August test, everybody wants to take that at late August test and say, oh, I want to be done before school starts. That late August test, students just do not perform well. Usually it, it hits right when school's starting, and so you've got eight million other things you've got to think about as well. But you're really still in summer mode. And it's only, and, and, and you're, you're going back, you're, 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 you're your body clock is changing because you're, you're, you're now back on this early morning schedule, and especially for teenagers, that's a really diff difficult transition to get back into the, your body clock back on the, on the morning schedule. And it really takes about three weeks to sort of get adjusted to it all again. And I see this with students. Like those first two weeks of September, you know, they really are, everybody's struggling and yawning and everything else. So you really want to get back in the swing of things before you start taking these tests. So that mid September ACT and the early October are really the best tests. You're in it, you're focused, you know what you're doing, and you're ready to go. And so that's really important. That's a really important one. Um, for juniors, I really like taking those early December tests for the first time. That's why. So that's why I like getting started now and sort of getting some, um, getting a numbers on the board before the holiday break is a really good idea. We're not necessarily going to use these scores, and we're going to talk about submitting scores, and so you don't need to use these scores. There's no sort of, you know, there are a few schools that want to see all your scores, but for the most part, you can pick and choose which numbers you, you're going to submit. So it's really, there's no um, downside to taking it in December, and it, but it really is a good, um, it really is a good one to take just to get that first one under your belt. Because then, because everybody takes, ends up taking that early February, early March, especially the SAT, that early March test. Um, and, you know, in the lead up to that, sort of February, in the beginning of school year, everybody's talking about the SAT, everybody's taking that March test, everybody's talking about what prep they're doing and everything, and it just creates this vicious cycle of anxiety that goes on with students, especially because they haven't taken it Again, so you know, if you're a student, yeah, I've taken it once. I got these numbers. I'm I'm going for the second time. You have such a leg up over most of your peers that way um, by taking it that second time. Plus, you're taking it a second time before, as I say, before you get into the uh, into the later parts of the semester, where other people who have to take it the later part of the semester are, are 
are really going into the teeth of that, of that, of that um, spring schedule. Okay, so choosing a test prep service. Okay, so basically, you know, you've got a lot of different choices. You can go with a private tutor, small group, large group, blend of group and private. I have taught all of these at some point. I will tell you right now, private one-on-one -on -one tutoring for test prep is the way to go, okay? It's more expensive, but it is far more effective for most students. And the reason is, is because this is an individual test. This isn't we're all learning the same thing. These are specific issues I'm having with specific questions, and I need somebody to tell me how to, how to pinpoint those specific issues. And you can't do that when you're teaching a class. You can sort of give it back and forth, but to really be most efficient in finding, because that's where the points are. The improvement comes not from what you do know. The, the improvement is with a tutor being able to pinpoint what you don't know and showing you how to do it. And so you only, otherwise you sit there in a survey course in a big class and you go through everything. Most of the stuff you already know how to do and you're bored. Um, and then, so and you, maybe, and you get bored and you miss the part where you really needed it because nobody's really drilling down and telling you what your weaknesses and strengths are. Um, and it's also, um, the tutoring is also really nice because it gets you on a regular schedule every week for this stuff. Yeah, you can go to a class and whatever, but this, this tutor will really keep you focused and really keep you learning through the, through, if it's a good tutor, really keep you learning through this and, and give you a real mental workout through that and really, and really make sure that you're on track and, and keep going. And it really is the most effective by far in terms of, in terms of both efficient and effective. And things you want to think about, company, reputation, how long they've been around. I mean, they have a good track record of success. Do they specialize in test prep or are they just some, you know, are they a general? You really want people who specialize in test prep. It's not the same as academic tutoring. It really isn't. Um, and you don't want somebody who's like, oh, you know, I teach uh, algebra and, and, and language and so on and so forth. And I also do SAT and AC. You really want somebody who knows these tests and knows what's going on because there are specific things that aren't necessarily a generalist can do. Um, is a contract required? Um, Personally, I don't require contracts. It's all pay as you go. But there are a lot of, a lot of companies that lock you into a lot of lessons. You've got to pay up front and do a lot of mm -hmm. lessons. Um, you know, that can, be a, that can be a problem. Also, you're kind of buying in before you really know what's going to happen here. Um, personally, I, I don't like to do that. I just basically, you know, pay, pay as you go. And, you know, most of my students that I'm staying with me for, you know, a lot of students that I'm staying with the whole year. But, um, you know, Finish the program that way. It's a lot easier. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what do you think would be the risk of a specific price for a private tutor? So, okay, so yeah, if you call around, if you call around for premium private tutoring, it's about, it's 200 bucks an hour. Um, yeah. Um, and, it, and the programs usually um, are about 20 to 25 hours um, for, for an initial uh, program. So I like to stay a little bit under. So I'm 175 an hour, and my initial program, I can get this really, I can get you prep much more efficiently because you know, I just know what I need to do and how to find it. So the basic program for me is around um, between uh, 12 and 15 hours um, for that initial program. So, so and, and I, like I said, Especially now that I just do it by myself, I'm not here to like juice you up for a lot of lessons because I don't need to. I don't need that many clients to, to, to keep my hour to keep the hours I need, and so I just and so I'm I'm happy to work with anybody and whatever their budget is on this. Um, but there are you know there are companies that say we want you know the whole you know we want the whole thing up front. This is our program. You're buying into it. Score guarantees. If you don't do well, you know, we guarantee you're going to get 300 points or whatever. It's a gimmick, okay? Because what they do is, oh, well, I didn't get 300 points. Oh, well, you can take the course again, you know? And it's basically for the classes and everything, but it really is a gimmick because if it didn't work the first time, is it really going to help you the second time, you know? Um, I mean, if you didn't improve, then, you know. So it really is sort of, it's a gimmicky thing, so don't buy into the whole score guarantee thing because it's not going to do anything. Okay, so let's talk about the program is, you know, is there, look at the program, is there a set curriculum? Um, 
Do they use official practice sets with official questions? We saw those ACT, really, really important. Don't, you know, a lot of these companies are just trying to sell books. Like, they, you know, they don't, they're all quite, but they have what, what I call question drift on this. Um, that uh, sort of just, you know, doesn't really, uh, you, you don't really see, get the actual test. Um, they have online materials. I'm, we are just, I spent the, last, the you know, two years during COVID, um, I've built an entire courseware suite for this um, that we're beta testing with students. It's going really well. We're going to be rolling out um, the official version, so the sort of public version in the spring. Um, but for right now, all my students have been using it, and it's really been effective. Um, uh, flexible hours, what, you know, lead time, longer, more effective. You know, there are companies that'll do like six weeks from here to there. You really want more time. It's not about cram. You can't cram for these tests. What you really do is you want to do it sort of drip, 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 drip all the way along. The longer lead time you have with this, the better you're going to do. Um, and do they do follow-ups? Like, you know, you take the first test first time, okay, see you later. What I recommend is you do initial program first time, and we get both the lessons out of the way the first time, and then we'll do follow-up lessons, two or three follow-up lessons before every next test you do, just to polish up and see what we're looking at. Look at the old score, score reports from your previous tests and really polish up. So you don't need to be doing lessons all the way through all the time, but it is a good idea to get the basics in and then follow up with each successive test you do, and do two or three lessons during for those tests, get you polished up again, because you forget what, you forget everything that went on. Okay. Um, now, in structure, in structure, this is really important. This is something that you're not going to get from a lot of the bigger, even the bigger tutoring services, is that it's a structure that can do all, both subjects, or all the subjects, verbal and math. Um, most, the, the economics of this basically, uh, uh, for most of the large tutoring companies, is that they're going to hire grad students, they're not going to pay them very well, you know, um, you know, they may be, of the tutoring dollar, the, that price I quoted you on the, you know, for, for premium tutoring, the tutors probably may see 25% of that, of, the, of what you're paying. Maybe, I shouldn't say that, but if it, depending on the tutor, they don't pay these tutors a lot, and so you have a lot of turnover in this. So you don't really get tutors that are that experienced, or even real teachers. Who say, yeah, I did great on my SAT, so now I can teach you, but not really. You know, and it, just because you did well doesn't mean you can teach it. And so there's a lot of reasons why that's true, but the first one is really important. You really want to see if you can get a tutor that teaches all subjects, because there's always the tension otherwise. There's, uh, you know, well, I like my verbal tutor better than my math tutor. You shouldn't have the student worrying about that. You shouldn't have the, tutor, the student just enjoying the tutoring, what they are, so it's really important. Extra time and accommodations. So, they, so usually time and a half, They'll usually give you extra time if you, if you have um, a professional diagnosis, ADHD, things like that. Um, and approval of your school, you need both of those things. Get started early if you think that's, that's an issue for you. Um, and the policies are there, you can check. There's all kinds of different things you need to do. Basically, the way it works, though, is that um, <clears throat> SAT is easier to get because it's much, it, it, but it's less helpful. It's, it, it's, an, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty leisurely test versus the ACT, so extra time really doesn't help you. If you've got a student who's got ADHD and he's getting antsy after three hours, he's gonna get a lot more antsy after four and a half. So it necessarily doesn't really help as much in the SAT. ACT, it's tougher to get, but it really does help because that extra time and a half is really helpful on the ACT. So if that's something you want to think about, if you can get time, I always tell parents, if you can get time on the ACT, it's a really good test to take. Okay, so deadlines for registration, about a month before the test. Um, you can do it online if you're male, if, it's under, if you're under 13. But it's a month before or two weeks if you need to, to do the deadline, but get in early on this stuff. These test centers are, are overcrowded right now. They're, they're really filled up. I have had students in the summer, now I think this is being alleviated, but over the summer, I had a student who, who signed up for the June test and the, and the August SAT, and they canceled on her both times. And she called us, the mom called the second time, said, what's going on? And they said um, the school had booked 200, or they had booked 200 um, testers for 100 seats. So, they ended up doing that June, the, in fairness, that August, they ended up re-giving 
for the students who missed it in a couple of weeks later. But still, you don't have to go through that. So, and also, you know, stu I've got students you know, having to drive nearly out of state for some of this stuff last year. Hopefully that's alleviated this year, but the testing, it's really difficult to find a testing center. So make sure you sign up early because it's really important, really important, especially in this environment. Okay, another thing, when you're registering, you can order your test booklet for specific tests, March, May, October for the SAT, April, June, December for the ACT, really helpful. Because not only do they give you the scores and sort of your answers, they actually give you a copy of the booklet. So they actually, you can actually see the specific questions you missed. And for a tutor standpoint, this is gold. I, I, you give me that test and those questions and I can tell you exactly, we can take you through exactly what you're missing and, and work it out. Um, so it's really important if it's one of these, if it's one of these test dates. Okay, really important, do not, they're going to ask you to submit scores. They want to say like four or five bucks a, a pop to submit a test to a, to a school. And they're going to want to sell you these things early. Don't do it when you're signing up for registration. You don't want to submit scores until you know what all your scores are, right? So wait till everything's done before you submit scores. Don't start, oh, I'm, I'm, I'll send this one to Harvard. You know, you, you don't want to do that. Right? So just, just wait till everything's done, you know where you want to go, what your numbers are, then submit them. Because they will try to get you to register to submit scores during registration. Okay, so it's preparing for test day. Let's talk a little about this. <clears throat> Here are things you want to bring. Admission test kit, photo ID, number two pencils, calculators, check your batteries, because you know what's going to happen. Um, <clears throat> snacks and drinks. So does anybody have an idea? of what the best snack to eat during a te standardized test is. Something soft. Something soft. Like not crunchy. Not crunchy. Well, we, you'll be eating them during the break. Probably won't be doing the test. Banana. Banana. Banana's a good one, actually. Banana's a good one. But the actual best thing, and they've done studies on this, the actual best thing to eat during a standardized test is a candy bar. Candy bar because the protein or the the carbs in a you know granola bar or whatever your body's going to process it here you know you got an hour and a half left in the test your body's going to process that after you get done whereas the sugar is going to hit you right away and it really is they they've done they've done studies on this they should eat a candy bar during a break it really helps um, and a watch is really important um, they don't let you add anything that beeps but uh, bring your own time you can't really trust the proctors on this. Um, as well as you'd like. Um, so just bring a watch, um, you know, and just a regular watch. If you don't have one, ask your dad or your mom. You know, they probably have one hanging around, right? I know people don't wear watches anymore. But, um, you know, just turn, the, turn it to nine, turn it to 12 o'clock, and then just watch the hand. It's like 9.54 in the morning, you get 35 minutes to do this. You, you got enough math to do in this test as it is. So just turn it to 12 o'clock and then just watch the hands go down. And then, um, and then when you get done, turn it back. And that way you can instantly tell how much time you had. Don't trust the proctors. If you feel like the proctors have, are shaving time off you and it does happen, they're not really, you know, they're not always paying attention. Um, make, sure that you, make sure you tell them. Say, hey, I, we got five minutes left. This is wrong. And, you know, because it's your test. And you don't have too many shots at this, so make sure you, you, know, make sure you want to get it right. All right, do not bring the, there's a whole list here, but the main thing is a cell phone. If they catch you with a cell phone in the test, they, they will most likely kick you out and cancel your scores. Because they don't want people to say, you know, calling and saying. So if you must bring your phone, you know, a lot of times students will drive themselves, put it in the car, leave it in the glove box. You must bring your, turn it completely off and bury it in the bottom of your backpack and don't look at it until you get out of the testing center. Okay, so the week before, when you're studying, more sleep. Most important thing, more sleep. Try and go to bed an hour earlier at night. Um, avoid screens, electronic screens, less than two hours before you go to bed at night. Um, that really will help you sleep. Now, you know, the students leave me, oh, yeah, sure, I'm going to get more sleep. You know, it, you know, but you really want to try that because it's all cumulative. You can't just do it the night before or a couple of days before. That whole week, you really want to... Try and get more sleep. It's really, it's so important. Sleep is so important for performance, especially for high school students. Um, and you want to taper your studying. You don't want to be jamming at the end of the week. And especially on Friday, that Friday before the test, people want to know how I'm cramming for the test. Don't do it. It's like running a 12K before you run a marathon. 
you want to study early in the week and then taper yourself down and rest up because it, it, you've been, if you've been doing this for like 10 weeks, you know this stuff. You know what's going on. Don't worry about it. But just give, you, give your brain time to sort of process and get ready and be fresh for Saturday. That's really what you want to do. Okay? Don't, like I said, don't practice questions the night before. Gather everything you need to do and relax. Chill out. Um, watch a movie, do something that's not going to be too strenuous. That whole day, actually. Try and just let your brain sort of just get ready for the next day. Um, big dinner, lots of fluids the night before, not the day of, especially the fluids part of it. Um, you, want your, you want your body to be able to, um, it's like athletes getting, athletes getting ready. Um, you want your body to be um, uh, absorbing that energy overnight so you're ready to go in the morning and ready to be fresh. Go to bed early, set your alarm. Okay, morning before, really important, get up early. Wear layers. You don't know how hot or cold it's going to be, especially this time of year um, in those classes, so just wear layers so you know what's going on, so you can take them off if you need to. Eat a normal breakfast, normal breakfast. There's always that temptation, I hear it every year, um, oh, yeah, I know, it was the SAT, so I usually eat just sort of like cereal, but today Dad made me a big greasy eggs and bacon breakfast because, and then they get in the test and they're just like, their stomach's like, you know, and then, and then they can't concentrate. Your stomach and your brain are, are intimately linked. And so if you, if you, if you distract, your, if your stomach's distracting, your brain can't help but have to pay attention to it. So you want something that's just going to keep your, um, your stomach set. Bana that's why bananas are good. They also have the sugar and they're also really, you know, uh, usually settle your stomach. But, um, uh, you, really, you, you want to be careful about that. Just eat what you normally eat. But if you don't eat breakfast, eat something. You want something in your stomach. It's a long test. You can be, it's a very strenuous test, too, so you want to make sure you get through it. Um, finally, and, this, and, and drink fluids in moderation. And don't drink coffee, if, for instance, if you're not used to it. You, you wake up every morning, have a cup of coffee, have a cup of coffee. If you don't, don't. I had one student. She, she, drink coffee this morning because I want to be alert. She never drank coffee before. She got the test. She's like, you know, and she and it, it just it just didn't work for her. So just just be careful. Don't change up your routines. But the last thing is really important here, and that's and that's what I say. Sweat it. Exercise the morning of the test. Ten to, and the studies show this. Ten to fifteen minutes of aerobic exercise prior to a test in the morning before a test can improve. They've done this with IQ tests. Now, IQ tests aren't supposed to change, you know, it's supposed to be the same test for you. They find the students who exercise before a test can do up to 10% better on their IQ test than those who don't. So, it's, I used to say, you know, it's a good idea, why don't you exercise? Now it's like, do it. When I have students who, um, students who are disappointed in their scores, I always ask them, did you exercise before the test? They never say yes. Students who are <clears throat> surprised by how well they did. Did you exercise? Yeah, I did. I did. And it really, it really is like, it's almost automatic a lot if you really, because it gets you focused, you know. And it doesn't have to, you know, get on the exercise bike. Just break a sweat. You don't, don't wear yourself out. Don't go running for an hour and, you know. But just 10 to 15 minutes, just get, the, get your blood flowing. If you break a sweat, you know your, your body's fully engaged. You're, getting, you're clearing out all the adrenaline and dopamine, all the excess um, things that just start pumping when you're nervous about a test, and it really does help just chill you out and get you ready to go. It's so important. Okay. At the test, arrive 10 to 15 minutes early. Make sure you get, then they tell you to, basically. Especially, you know, these crowded test centers, you really want, especially if you don't know where you're going and you haven't been to the school before, um, you know, you really want to make sure you know where you're going. Stay cool, chill out, relax, and I always tell people don't socialize. Be a little antisocial. Okay, so you got the you got the student there who's you know you're sitting there and your girlfriend comes up to you and she's like she's like oh my god do you believe this I'm gonna do this where are you located where are you going and she's just in she's just talking to you um, and you know it, you all she's doing is she's just she's nervous herself so she's just trying to talk to you to keep from distracting yourself from being nervous. but all she's doing is distracting you right so you know just say to your friends like you know hey just you know, give me a little time, I need a little time, I'll talk to you after the test. Because what you want to do, I always say this, like the people who are talking in the hallway before the test, they're not the ones who are going to do the best on this test. It's the guy in the corner who's just sitting there, like the, the quiet guy in the corner. 
He's the guy who's going to do the best because he's getting focused. He's thinking about what he wants to do during the test and really understanding what's going to, you know, what, what he wants to do. And, and, and it's really about that. The whole test, the whole attitude you want to have during the test is just relaxed intensity. You don't want to be too up. You don't want to be too up. You just want to be focused on what you on each test. You just take every question one at a time and just sort of let it all happen. And just be present in the test. And if you've got a lot of other distractions going on, that's going to hurt you. So really just be focused. Just try and get focused. Really important. Okay, during the test, keep your own time. We talked about the, the, using, the, using the watch. Use your breaks. Stand up during, don't sit there for three and a half hours, hunched over, all the blood's going to flow to your feet. You're not going to get any oxygen to your brain. Stand up, take a few deep breaths, eat and drink something at every break. Make sure you do it. You want to keep your energy up. You want to keep your oxygen levels up. Keep going. This is, you know, it's, it's, it's not all mental. It is physical, and it's all, it is related. And, and performance issues are very much related to the physical side of this um, in, terms of, in terms of your hormones and everything else that, that goes on during this. So these are really things to think about. Start each section fresh. Oh, my God, I think I bombed that writing section. Oh, my God, my test done. Well, not really. The studies show that students are the worst, test takers are the worst judges of how they're going to do on a test. So you don't know. A lot of times, you know, you take a test and you think you did really well and you didn't do so well. Other times you think you're real, oh my God, I bombed it. Oh, I got an A. You know, you don't know. So don't assume anything. Stick with it. Start every section like, just forget about what you did. Either you did well or you did poorly. I don't care. I got this to deal with now. And just keep moving. Um, and power through, everybody gets tired. It's a long test. It's the longest test you're going to take in your high school academic career, probably. Maybe the APs or something. But if you hit, a, you know, so just keep moving. Everybody gets tired. It's the people who can really power through the end of that test are the ones who are going to be happy with their scores. Um, and if you hit a wall, here's the other thing, though. Stop. I've read the same thing three times in a row, and I still don't know what it says. I can't read it right now. Your brain's redlining. Just stop. Take three breaths, look up at the ceiling, give yourself a little bit of time. When you come back, you'll be able to see it. Really, it's really important that, that people try to power through. You're just going to, and you see this in the test scores. Like, all of a sudden, like, at one point, students doing really well, and all of a sudden just starts missing a bunch of questions in a row. And it's because they're, they just didn't stop and take a break. Um, and they just start missing, their, and all of a sudden, the accuracy just goes down. And afterwards, go celebrate. You earned it. Okay, this is a this is a big deal. You know, it's not. You know, it, I mean, you can always take it again. No big deal. But it is it is it is quite an accomplishment to sit through this test and do this big test. So, treat yourself to something. Have something planned. Have something where at the end of the day, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to do something that's going to for me because I've put the time in on this. I've gotten through it. Let's let's go. Just take some time for me. Okay, so scores come back. You take the test. Scores come back three weeks later around three weeks later. What do they mean? What is, this, what is this all about? So this is really, these are percentiles. Percentiles are basically the percentage of students that you did as well or better that on the test. And if you see, can see the breakdowns, they sort of mirror each other on the scores here. Sort of at 800, obviously, at 35, 36, 700, you know, is around in the 90th percentile, 625 around the, in the 70th percentile, five, and so on and so forth. And I like to think of the scores, you know, how much, how, how much do you want to, how much do you think you can improve? Most students, after training, what we try to do is we get you to it solidly within the next level. So if you're at 500, we want to get you solidly into the 600s. So in other words, so, and that's 600 for both topics, so for math and for verbal. If you're at a 20, we want to get you to 25. If you're at a 600, we want to get you to 700. Make sense? And so really for most students, what, what I'm doing as a tutor is I'm really just optimizing your score. I'm not taking the test for you. I'm not, you know, but I am making it possible for you to do as, best, as well as you can. And most students after training can get to that next level. And the way you think about it is that 500 or that 20 is sort of what is like minimal college readiness. So that's sort of the breakdown of just to be able to get in any school at all. Um, 600 is where the more selective schools start. And then that next 700 level is where the very selective schools start. So you want to think about that sort of the different levels of schools as well 
in terms of the percentiles. Any questions on that? All right, so send in your scores. Like I said, only send scores after all the tests are done. You don't want to send them first. Now, most colleges, getting back to your question, will accept your best test sittings. They do what's known as super score. Okay, so the way it works like this. You get, take your score the first time, you take your test the first time. <clears throat> you get, let's say you get, um, you get a 600 on your verbal and a 650 on your math. And then the next test you take it, you get a 600, and then you take it again, and you get a 600 on your math, and you get a 650 on your verbal. Now, if you were just sending individual scores, that'd be 1250 for individual tests. But what schools will allow you to do is a super score. So you take the best, so you submit both tests, and the schools will take the best scores for both of them, so that you end up with a 1300. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So it re that's another reason it really does behoove people to take this test multiple times. Because even if you get, you know, I got a good reading number, I'm trying to get my math number up, you can still do this and take it multiple times to get your math number up. Um, so you want to do it at least twice because you want to give yourself a chance to, to, really, to really have those numbers pop. So most, almost the vast majority of college will, will super score um, and, and will now super score both the SAT and ACT. They used to not do the ACT, but now they're doing the ACT as well. So you can really get a super score number for your ACT as well. And like science, if the science section was giving you trouble and you, you, you ended up popping that a little later. Um, a few colleges want to see all your, I think Georgetown, um, maybe Yale, um, a few others want to see all of them. Like I said, check with the schools. But for the most part, you know, the vast majority of schools don't. So, you know, unless, unless there's a specific reason, just assume super scores apply. Um, last thing today I want to talk about is, um, is sort of performance issues. Real quick here. Um, there's basically, they did, a, they did a study of in Taiwan of 13-year-olds who, in, they, in Taiwan, they take one test one time when they're basically at jun uh, junior high school level. And this test determines not just where you go to high school, but whether you go to high school at all. At least this was when they the, did the study on this. And they did genetic, sort of genetic um, monitoring of the students, and they sort, of, they sort of got their genetic profiles on this. So they had a really, it was like 10,000 students study, big study. And they found that there are two types of, I'm not getting too into the details, there are two types of genetic markers here that really do predict test anxiety. Okay, so, it, and it's all having to do with dopamine. If you clear dopamine quickly, dopamine sort of is um, the thing, the, the, the main chemical that makes your brain, brain function normally. But if you have too much dopamine, you just can't think. If you're overloaded, if, if, like if you're, you know, if you're scared, if you've got a lot of adrenaline problem, you're really nervous, you pump a lot of a dopamine and you just can't think well because um, you're, just, you're just overloaded. And because you don't clear it quickly, it takes a while for you to sort of get back to normal. Now, students who are prone to this, there's about, so the way the genetic markers work, there's about 25% of students who are prone to it. 50% are sort of in the normal range. They have a mix of both. And then there are students who have sort of both genetic markers on the other side. And these are sort of these relaxed students, you know, the students who, uh, you know, they don't work hard, they're kind of lazy, they, but they go in and take a test and they blow the doors out, right? So that, that um, they're, they're a whole different view, but it really is, they really found that it's based on these genetic markers. So there's different strategies depending on if you think your student is that. For instance, if you've got a student who's the more relaxed side, um, you really want to raise the stakes, and a really good way to do that is to have them go visit colleges, and I recommend that in general. It will really get you motivated. Now you see why you're studying for the SAT and ACT. Go see a college, see where you want to go, and it really will get you motivated. And a lot of times that really does help, especially these students start to think, maybe this is important. <clears throat> for the students with test anxiety, and this is really the issue. I mean, if there was a pill for test anxiety, it, you know, it'd be great, because it really is a tough issue for most students, for a lot of students who have this. Um, you really want to lower the tension. Prep is really important. You want to make them feel very comfortable. Exercise is really good for that. But really, you've got to get them to relax. And part of it is if you know this is what you're prone to, a lot of times you, can, you, it, you don't feel like you're out of control with it because you know, OK, so my brain is, is, you know, is, is overloading here. I, I can understand that. I just need to relax and chill. A lot of times just knowing that is going to help. 
But that's really why test anxiety happens, is because you're doing that. And you see it, like students will, you know, students with test anxiety, it's always the same thing. They start, like, they'll start and they'll really not do well in the first one and then do much better later in the test. And you see how all of a sudden the, the dopamine's clearing and you can see how the tests are doing better. So if you have, so these are two different types of students, especially in the test anxiety thing. It's really about not stressing. And it's really about, especially, you know, and parents can have a big play one way or the other on this, right? So stay relaxed, you know, parents, you know, the week of the test, like a lot of parents, are you studying for the SAT? Is that you said? No, Adam told me to relax. Well, listen to Adam, what Adam said, because that really, it's true. You really want to just chill out on this. So that's my, that's, that's sort of the, the, the quick and dirty on that. Okay. That's my presentation today. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I want to thank the Bell Tip Library and Re Rebecca Jung, the hardest working youth librarian in Marin. <laughs>